Hello, I'm George Smith, and this is the third talk in a series of at least five talks on the history of libertarian ideas. The theme I'll be discussing today is the history of property rights, the idea of property in general. This is an extraordinarily important theme in the history of libertarian thought, and its development is, I think, necessary, its historical development, to understand what libertarians mean, or at least have meant historically, when they talk about property. I must say that there are so many nuances to this, so many details, that even if I had 20 times more time to speak about this than I do now, I could just barely scratch the surface. So you'll understand, I hope, if I just fly over a lot of these issues very quickly without discussing details. I will say, however, that I have a short stack of books here, just a few books that are relevant, and if I can remember later on, I will mention some titles to you, so if you want to do additional reading. First, however, I want to frame this talk by pointing out a common objection that I'm sure virtually all of my viewers have heard at one time or another, whether you're a libertarian or whether you're not a libertarian, and basically it goes like this. You libertarians care more about people, I'm sorry, you libertarians care more about property than people. That's the way it's often put. Whereas we modern day liberals care about people. We really care. Um, we care about poor people. Whereas all you libertarians really care about is your own property and you defend greedy, grubby little businessmen and their rights to keep their property. And Whereas we want to help people. We're helpful, caring people and you're cold and callous and need I say more. The first thing to understand about this, I mean there are many things that can be said about this and really anyone who says that's a pretty ignorant person to begin with, but let's deal with some problems here. I mean a, a standard libertarian reply is to say that human rights are property rights and there's a, a great deal of wisdom in that statement because the way property has been treated historically it's been inextricably, inextricably tied to the idea of rights. And let me say, uh, give an example specifically of what I'm talking about. And uh, the unfortunate aspect of this is how we use the word property today isn't how the term property was used for, say, beginning in the early 17th century throughout the, to the late 18th century. And this is a, a significant way of looking at it. Let me give you an example. Here's a book. Today we would probably say, this book is my property. In other words, property would refer specifically to an external object, or perhaps there could be so-called intellectual property, but let's take it with something external. And to say I own it or that it's my property means I can use and dispose of it as I please. But historically, in the libertarian tradition, the term property had a much broader meaning. And if we were living in the 17th century, we, I would be more likely to say, I have a property in this book. Not that this book is my property, but I have a property in this book. Property here meant a claim of moral jurisdiction. Uh, I have a, it means the same thing in the case of the book. It means I have a right to dispose of the book, to you know read it, mark in it, tear it up, do whatever I want with the book. But the expression, I have a property in such and such, is an extremely important way of putting the matter. Because when we get to early 17th century figures and going up in the later 17th century to someone like John Locke, John Locke, following this tradition, he was by no means the first to use this type of language, he says that each, per, uh, each man has a property in his own person. The idea of property in one's person might sound like an odd way of speaking today. In fact, I've often, uh, some philosophers have argued, well, that makes no sense because you can't regard a human being as property. Well, that's not what we said. We said, I have property in my own person. And they go on to say, but you know, it's bifurcating human nature. It suggests to say that this part of his property and another part owns that part. It gets very complex. But that, is, that sort of a kind of facile objection rests on a complete misunderstanding of the, what was meant by property in the libertarian tradition. And it's important to understand this, that when somebody said, I have a property in my own person, this is sometimes called self-ownership. In earlier centuries, it was sometimes called self-proprietorship, a fairly common expression in the 17th century. It means I have moral jurisdiction in my own body, in my mind, in my labor. It doesn't mean that one half of me somehow owns the other half. It's not referring to a thing. It's referring to moral jurisdiction. Similarly, a very common expression in the 17th and 18th centuries was property in one's own conscience. And meant that meant you have the right to believe as you wish. It meant you have moral jurisdiction over your beliefs. 
for James Madison, and I'll be referring to this later. In fact, I, I might as well refer to it now because it's directly relevant. James Madison, uh, the so-called uh, uh, father of the U.S. Constitution, which is a little misleading, but nevertheless, that's what he's known as, wrote a very interesting uh, newspaper article in 1792. It was called Property. And what Madison does here is he highlights the transition between the older meaning of property and the newer meaning of property. And this is a very interesting window on, on, our past, on the past usage of this term, property. Let me just read how this begins. Madison wrote, this term, property, in its particular application means that domination which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in exclusion of every other individual. Now that would indicate the meaning I mentioned, the modern meaning, this book is my property. But he goes on to say, in its larger and juster meaning, property embases everything to which a man may attach a value and have a right, and which leaves to everyone else the like advantage. This is the older, the classical meaning, which he called the broader meaning, a property in something. Now let's look at some of the examples he gives, which are very interesting. Madison continues, in the former sense, a man's land or merchandise is, uh, of, or money is called his property. In the latter sense, a man has a property in his opinions and in the free communication of them. He has a property of peculiar value in his religious opinions and in the profession and practice dictated by them. He has a property very dear to him in the safety and liberty of his person. He has an equal property in the free use of his faculties, free choice, and of the objects to which to employ them. In a word, Madison says, <clears throat> as a man is said to have a right to his property, he may equally be said to have a property in his rights. Now there's more to this article. He goes on to talk about um, property in one's time. He uses that as an argument against Sabbatarian laws. By the way, why did Madison write this piece? I'm convinced he wrote it from the context of, of reading the entire article to argue probably against the so-called Federalists of his time, the late 18th century, who were pretty much the big government conservatives of their day. And uh, the, the Federalists were known for defending, quote, property rights, but in the sense of external property. They were, as conservatives today are, weak on the issue of so-called civil rights, religious freedom, uh, freedom of lifestyles, that sort of thing. And I think what Madison was getting at here and addressing these people was, look, if you want to be a consistent defender of property rights, then you just can't attack the government when it overtaxes or whatever. If you're a consistent defender, now this is not obviously what Madison said, but putting it in a modern context, you would have to defend a human property and everything, legitimate property. Uh, if a person is a self-owner, what he or she puts in his or her body is up to him. Property in one's person, that would be the, include the right to take illicit drugs. It's a very uh, clear example of this. Uh, other rights, uh, uh, the, uh, well I won't go into all the particulars, we can understand here that I think Madison was saying a consistent defender of rights is going to have to defend the wider conception of property, property in such and such. Now, the interesting question historically, and this is where it gets rather uh, confusing or technical historically because there's so many opinions that have been written about this, is when did this conception of property in the broad sense, property in, property as moral dominion over something, whether it's your own person, your opinions, external goods, or whatever. When did this really solidify, and who originated it? Well, if we go back, and I'm going to have to uh, do a little digression here to explain the context. If we go back to the early Christian era, we find the standard opinion expressed by church fathers, including Augustine in the early 4th century, to the, uh, who, uh, to the effect, the opinion to the effect that property is not a natural right. It is instead a conventional right granted by government. Now, to understand this framework, you have to understand the dispute and the in very interesting debates about the nature of what was called prelapsarian man. Prelapsarian here refers to human nature before man's fall into sin. In the biblical account of, of Eden, of course, it would be the, uh, uh, Eve eating the apple and bringing it to Adam and all that. But the, the question was, what was the effect of original sin on human nature? The, the account of Augustine was very pessimistic. He thought original sin had per so vitiated, so corrupted human nature that, first of all, 
our natural tendencies had become evil and he was especially concerned with what he called concupiscence, lust. And although Augustine used that in a broad sense to mean every type of inordinate or excessive desire, he specifically focused on sexual uh, desire, which is what we already ordinarily mean by concupiscent today. And he has these long, involved, and rather strange passages discussing things like uh, what would be the nature of intercourse if, if human beings had never sinned. Uh, would human beings have had orgasms? He seems to think not. He thinks that thinks all that pleasure uh, was uh, the result of original sin. Um, the obvious jokes here, I'll bypass. Um, three cheers for original sin, and so forth. But anyway, this, this fascination with this duality of human nature, human nature before the fall, in other words, perfect uh, human beings, because they were created in the image of God, versus after the fall, a corrupted human nature. What were the differences? Well, as I said, Every church father, virtually every church father, including Augustine, agreed that there were three institutions that existed after the fall in the post-lapsarian condition that did not exist and would never have existed prior to the fall, or if the fall into sin had never occurred. These three institutions were, first of all, government, because government wouldn't have been necessary because human beings would never have harmed anyone else. Slavery. Now the justification for slavery would have been, it's difficult to explain, it's more complex than the others, but uh, Augustine, for example, said that these three institutions, government, slavery, and as you shall see, property, were both a God's remedy and punishment for sin, original sin. So they were, these institutions were viewed as a way both for God to punish people and also a way to keep people in control uh, because they're now these sort of passion-ridden creatures that can't control their nasty impulses and therefore require certain remedial institutions to keep them in check. And the third institution, as I indicated briefly a second ago, was uh, property, private property. So let's focus on the private property issue. Why would property not have been necessary uh, in prelapsarian, uh, the sort of Garden of Eden, sort of a utopian situation? And I'll just mention briefly here that the early Christian account, it was an odd mixture, an odd blend of the Garden of Eden account as understood by the early Christians and the Stoic, Roman Stoic Seneca centuries later, uh, who also had this theory of a golden age where na human nature was more or less uncorrupted. No, you would not have had private property. So what's the big deal about private property? Well, private property was commonly associated with, the, with avarice or greed, uh, sin. Uh, greedy human nature. If we were really as we God originally created us, we would give people in need whatever they wanted, whatever they needed. We wouldn't keep things for ourselves. We'd just keep enough to live on. And this goes way beyond the modern liberal view. It's, it wouldn't be just Americans. We would be, you know, helping people in other countries. This would all be voluntary. Um, it doesn't necessarily apply. This. It would be state enforced. But private property was only brought about because of human greed and avarice. And there were two arguments here. One was uh, well, the main argument was that people will, will get all they can and steal from others unless we have clearly defined property rights. Property rights at least tell us what the limits are of our greed and then a government will force us not to steal and rob and that sort of thing. And also you find the argument that was used by Aristotle that private property leads to, uh, it is better for motivating people to work. The, Plato's Utopia, as outlined in uh, his book The Republic, goes into how the guardians would hold all property in common, including wives. Aristotle criticized Plato, said, uh, criticizing Plato said, uh, look, you won't have any incentive. Uh, people won't have any incentive to work if all property is held in common, each according to his need. Uh, therefore, you need private property so people can benefit from the effects of their own labor. That's a, an argument still used today, and it was uh, passed on by some of these Christian theologians. And you can see by how, you know, my digressions, uh, how complex this can get. But moving forward in time, uh, you have Augustine reinforcing the, I'm um, sorry, Aristotle, uh, <laughs> Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, reinforcing the view that property rights are ultimately conventional. They're not natural. Now this is based on the view that in prelapsarian society, property would have originally been held in common, land especially. Uh, there's some passages in Genesis that indicates that God bestowed all of, uh, all of this stuff on mankind and uh, property would have been originally held in common. Private property became necessary for reasons I explained earlier. But what this led to was the view 
that if a person is desperate, if you have a poor person who's in an emergency situation, that person would actually be justified in stealing property from rich people or people with more money. Because in a situation of desperation, of, of starvation, uh, the property reverts back to its original uh, communistic state. This really was a theory of primitive communism, a theory that runs well into the modern era, that there was a primitive communism, uh, people owned everything in common, and for various reasons, Rousseau has this idea too, uh, greed took over and we had private property. And some of these sort of radical Protestant sects in the 17th century, after the Reformation of course, uh, wanted to kind of restore that original communism. In other words, look at it this way. You're post-Reformation, you're a Protestant, and you reject the church's teachings about various things, and you don't think there's an authority any longer. And you read the Bible about this uh, wonderful, glorious uh, Garden of Eden, and you think, what would have happened if only Adam and Eve had not sinned? And then you think, well, maybe original sin, maybe we can wash it away somehow, maybe we can get rid of it. And it, some of these groups believe this, and if we can get rid of it, then we don't have any need for those three institutions anymore. So we don't need government, which from my point of view is a plus. There's, you see what a mixed bag this is. We don't need slavery. That's a definite plus. So a lot of these people were early anti-slavery advocates. But third, we don't need private property. Now that, to my point, my way of thinking, is a negative because then they advocated a restoration of the original uh, uh, community, common community of property. So it's a very, very mixed bag from a libertarian point of view because these three institutions were all lumped together. Now what we have though, and distinctly emerging, and by the way, this is, uh, goes back to my earlier question, when specifically did this libertarian view of property, not only uh, as a natural right, which is important, in other words, the transition includes, first of all, a transition from the view that property is a conventional or a legal right, created by government, to the view that property is a natural right, a right that governments have no right or no proper authority to overthrow or to intervene in. And that, of course, is a common libertarian view, that property rights are natural rights, in that broad sense I mentioned earlier. There's also the second point, which is when did this view emerge of that general meaning of property, meaning moral jurisdiction, property in, when did that view emerge? Well, this is where the historical accounts gets very sticky because uh, according to some accounts, it's in the late Middle Ages that we find this, what some kind of, sometimes called the dominion theory of property. That is to have property in something is to have dominion over it. And that's related to what's called the development of a theory of subjective rights as opposed to objective right. And here we get into another technical area that I, I even mentioned briefly at my own risk, but I do want to mention this, this uh, because it is an important distinction. By objective right, in this context, all it means is a law, a moral standard, a moral rule, a rule external to oneself. So if a moral law says you ought to do this, then you ought to do this. It's not up to you to decide. A subjective right, which, which was a form of property rights, was considered to be a right inhering in the active subject, acting agent, I should say, acting agent. Uh, this has nothing to do with subjective in a bad, evil, Ayn Rand sense of whim or anything like that. It just means that a right that I have that doesn't come, is not imposed on me by an external authority. And a subjective right doesn't say you, should, you can only do X. A subjective right says you can do a bunch of different things. You can choose with your own property, do X or Y or Z. It gives you the discretion. This is called the subjective theory of rights. So this question comes up in all this literature, when did the subjective theory of property rights begin to emerge? Uh, standard accounts, and that's why I have these books stacked here, I'll just mention the titles. Richard Tuck's Natural Rights Theories of Origin and Development, sees it in the later Middle Ages emerging. There's other books here, Liberty, Right, and Nature, Individual Rights and Later Scholastic Thought. The great book, my favorite by the way, by Brian Tierney, The Idea of Natural Rights, and there's a lot of literature on this. Now, I previously discussed the common view, common among all early Christian theologians, that all property had originally been held in common. This would be in the prelapsarian human condition, that is, the Garden of Eden, so to speak. And the post-lapsarian view, that private property arose only as a uh, punishment and remedy for sin, along with government and slavery, or the two other institutions. Uh, this had, as I said, profound consequences. But how did theorists 
especially later theorists, deal with the issue of how historically did common property become private property. Now this comes up most especially in the area of land, which has always been kind of a sticking point in libertarian theory. You have libertarians, the modern libertarian theory, do, the dominant theory, is that private pro, uh, property and land is perfectly justifiable. It's a scarce resource, that's the reason we need property, private property rights and land, and just like we have private property rights and other things. But we have it's very odd positions taken among various well-known libertarians. Herbert Spencer, for example, who was hardcore libertarian all the way down the line, argued explicitly against private property and land in his great early work, Social Statics. Uh, he explicitly denies it. I wrote a number of articles on this in my Cato uh, weekly essay, so check out libertarianism.org if you want to see this sort of thing, uh, the details uh, that I can't discuss here. Then, of course, you have Henry George and his so-called single tax view. He was influenced by Spencer. Uh, he was, his remedy for the problem of land ownership was different. And you, you've got the hardcore private ownership types. You have all these views. So anyone who thinks that the history of libertarian thought is this monolithic doctrine, it's just not true. Um, but how did this transition occur? Well, in the early 17th century, in writers like Hugo Grotius, the great uh, Protestant natural law theorist, he argued that the transition from common property, a state of communism, Primitive communism is sometimes called to private property, occurred gradually and occurred with the tacit consent of the commoners. A very implausible theory, but the argument is historically, as societies advanced and evolved to greater complexity, greater resources, people understood that you need private property. You can't function, a society couldn't function under a system of pure communism. That, but then you have the view also, this is most commonly associated with uh, the, the great successor of. Um, of uh, Grotius named Samuel Pufendorf, another important natural law philosopher, Pufendorf argued for what he called a negative community of goods as opposed to a positive community of goods. This was kind of a sly, in my view, sly, a correct position, but a sly uh, device to sort of get around the problem of a primitive communism, the transition to private property. By negative communion of goods or uh, negative common ownership, what Pufendorf meant was unowned. He argued that natural resources, and that's what we're really talking about here, natural resources were originally unowned. They were open to all to use. There was a common usufruct right, it was called, a right to use. So if land was unowned, anyone could go and use it. But once private property in that land had been established, it didn't really require the consent of the commoners because nobody had a positive right to it. So you've got this negative view of common ownership that Common ownership simply meant unowned. It didn't mean owned by everyone jointly. It was not a type of joint ownership. We get to John Locke, the most famous uh, philosopher in this tradition, and things become very muddled because in his two treaties of government, at time Locke seems to take the positive view, the idea of positive communal ownership, and all, sometimes he seems to take the negative view. But ultimately Locke regarded this as irrelevant because he argued that one thing that is, it was never common property was one's own person. And this led Locke to argue that by nature, not by convention, but by nature, every person has a prop, every man has a property in his own person. That's how he put it, that older usage of property. And he then went on beginning with this foundation, this pillar, so to speak, of ownership in one's own person. Uh, he went on to argue that we acquire property in external things by mixing our labor with them. Uh, you probably all know about this, I'm not going to go into the details, but that's how Locke tried to get around the problem. He said, well, it may be true that uh, natural resources were originally owned in common in some sense, but it doesn't really matter because whether it's negative or positive ownership, nobody ever owned the individual except the individual. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure those of you familiar with libertarian theory have heard the notion of self-ownership before. In earlier centuries, it was sometimes called um, self-proprietorship. Um, Self-sovereignty was another term. I think Josiah Warren, the 19th century American anarchist, used that term. And what that meant was you have moral jurisdiction, ultimate decision-making power over how your labor shall be used, how your body shall be used, how uh, your mind, and, and so on and so on. And that is the ultimate foundation, moral foundation, of modern libertarian thought. Now, <clears throat> if this isn't just some sort of pleasant bromide talking about self-ownership. If I were to pinpoint a historical moment when this was an extraordinarily important argument, there's no question what it would be. It would be in slavery controversies and pre-Civil War America. 
Because if you ever want to see stress on self-ownership, if you ever want to see that libertarian position explicitly and repeatedly defended, just read the so-called abolitionist literature, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, a bunch of others. There's entire pamphlets written on the importance of self-ownership. Because you see slavery, chattel slavery, what is it? It was said to be ownership of one person by another. The retort to that, the reply to that was, one person cannot own another person because every person is a self-owner. It was even argued that, but I won't get into this, it's a complicated argument, that you couldn't even sell yourself into slavery. Under no conditions could you be put into slavery. Um, and to, just to give you an example of this, a very well-known Unitarian minister and abolitionist of that time, mid, roughly mid-19th century, was uh, William Ellery Channing. He was also a transcendentalist. And he wrote an entire essay on the issue of, uh, it's actually a section of an essay, on the issue of self-ownership uh, in relation to slavery. And here's, what, uh, here's this part of what uh, uh, Channing said, quote, that a human being cannot be justly held and used as property. It's apparent from the very nature of property. Property is an exclusive right. It shuts out all claim but that of the possessor. What one man owns cannot belong to another. What then is the consequence of holding a human being as property? Plainly this, he can have no right to himself. His limbs are, in truth, not morally his own. He has not a right to his own strength. It belongs to another. His will, intellect, and muscles, all the powers of body and mind which are exercised in labor, he is bound to regard as another's. Now if there is property in anything, it is that of a man in his own person, mind, and strength. All other rights are weak, unmeaning compared with this, and in, die and in denying this, that is the right of self-ownership, all right is denied. And of course he goes on to argue, as I mentioned earlier, nobody else can own you because you own yourself. This became a very important uh, theme in the abolitionist literature, as I said. For example, uh, the abolitionists were opposed to the so-called gradualists, like Abraham Lincoln, who, want, who originally viewed uh, prop, uh, or against slavery, but they thought it would and should die out gradually. I think Lincoln at one point in the late 1850s predicted that slavery would die out in 100 years, which it means, according to this great president, uh, slavery would have ended around 1958. But the abolitionists, that's one reason they were originally suspicious of Lincoln, and William Lloyd Garrison wrote a very interesting tract in which he argued against the gradualists. Uh, the famous expression which I love from Garrison was that gradualism is, in theory is perpetuity in practice. In other words, if you preach gradual road to justice and oppose immediate repeal of unjust laws, you're going to end up with the unjust laws never being repealed. There will always be an excuse. Well, we can't do it now. We can't do it now. We have to wait. We have to wait. So. Uh, Gradualism in theory, as I said, is perpetuity in practice. But the other discussion he had is that he regarded self-ownership of the slave as morally uh, primary, as more important, more fundamental than any other issue. So to those gradualists who said, well, we want to get rid of slavery eventually, but if we do, southern agriculture will fail, it will affect the north, so we have to phase it out. To that, and I think this is an exact quote, I've used it many times in talks, so I've got it more or less memorized, Garrison said, uh, the right of a man to himself is paramount to every other claim. Meaning not only did every slave have a right to himself, but it's paramount to every other argument of, about gradualism. He basically said, we don't care what you think the social consequences of slavery are. Uh, the, a man, the right of a man to himself, that is self-ownership, is the fundamental right. And you can't keep people in slavery on the excuse that it's somehow inconvenient to free them. That's not your business. You have no right to do that to any man. So I'd like to point out that if you think the right of self-ownership is just some kind of bromide that libertarian Jews to defend the rights of big business or the, the usual cliches we hear, keep in mind that it was the foundation of the abolitionist anti-slavery movement. And it's not an accident that many of the later 19th century libertarians, American libertarians, came out of abolitionism. The, the uh, most prominent example in that regard being Lysander Spooner, one of the greatest libertarian writers of all time. He was a fervid abolitionist. Uh, Spooner wrote a broadside that historians believe, although they can't prove it, was the inspiration for John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, which failed miserably. But Spooner had this idea that the slaves should basically do a kind of a Spartacus kind of thing. There should be slave revolts, the slaves should gather in the mountains, form bands of guerrilla fighters, and go and free other slaves uh, until they can, you know, uh, abolish slavery through that method. 
Uh, it's a fascinating story, but to show you how radical Spooner was, and he later became associated with the uh, anarchists, with the Benjamin Tucker anarchists, so-called individualist anarchists, when uh, John Brown had been captured and sentenced to hang, Spooner supposedly, we have some correspondence about this, Spooner supposedly conspired to get a bunch of people together uh, and kidnap Governor Wise of Virginia, take him out on a boat and hold him as ransom in exchange for freeing John Brown. Uh, even Garrett Smith, the wealthy New York landowner, was involved in, apparently in this conspiracy, which never came to fruition, that was probably a good thing. But we're dealing with hardcore libertarian types, uh, that's my point here, and it's not accidental that they came out of this anti-slavery movement, because as I said, the foundation of abolitionism was self-ownership. Now, there are many other respects in the course of trying to rebut this inane argument, all you libertarians care about is property, you don't care about people. There are many other aspects to this that if I had a lot more time, if I wanted to take a lot more time, I could explain to you. But I hope I've made it sufficiently clear how just historically shallow that whole approach is. Because someone like an abolitionist would say, what do you mean? Yeah, we're interested in self-ownership, we're interested in the right of the slave to himself, a type of property right, but that is the fundamental human right. And what sense does it even make to talk uh, take, make to talk about human rights if you can't talk about the property right, uh, the property in something, meaning the right to control how that shall be used? If people don't have property rights, you can't even object to slavery. Uh, there'd be no objection to it. So to conclude this uh, talk, again, I want to emphasize that the idea of property rights historically is a rich, diverse, and fascinating topic and I strongly urge you not to accept any of that nonsense that's commonly heard that somehow libertarians defend property rights just because they want to... I mean, I'm not... By the way, I don't mean to demean the importance of being able to keep what you earn. That's essential. I'm, and I admire people who get wealthy from their own efforts without using government. And all libertarians do. But we shouldn't think that when we talk about property rights, we're just talking about external stuff, that all we care about is stuff. Uh, I can think of no comparable, any political tradition that has been so concerned about the moral autonomy of human beings, the right of each human being, with property in his or her own person, to make his or her own decisions uh, and live a happy life according to his or her own lights. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for watching, and we'll pick up and talk for with another theme.